Welcome to the Hunt the Wild podcast, where we explore the world of hunting. From gear and technique, to ethics and conservation, join us as we talk to experienced hunters. Deer fit right in the trunk. You put them in a, in a you can go on eBay and buy a $20 cadaver bag. So Industry experts. Even though I've missed deer, that's not failure. I just didn't bring them home. I succeeded. And the only thing I didn't do was run an arrow through it. And other outdoor enthusiasts to share stories, insights, and tips on all things hunting. I didn't understand the respect that hunters have for the animals they're hunting. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, this podcast has something for everyone who loves the thrill of the hunt. So grab your gear and let's dive in. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Um, I'm your host, Adam Bolds. Uh, it's, it's been a long time since I've done a show. Life gets busy. Um, still still hunting, still fishing, still doing the same thing, but uh, just had to make some more time for this podcast. I missed it. But I got, uh, got my buddies here, uh, Chun and uh, Dustin from Pursuit Platforms. Um, I'm a big, big fan of their platform. Um, I used it to hunt out of last year, actually shot my buck out of it last year in, in early October. So um, I wanted to bring them on here and talk about their platform, kind of how they designed it, because I think it can help a lot of hunters out, super lightweight. And um, yeah, so I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and we'll kind of roll into the show and, and dive into this pursuit platform. Awesome. Well, I'm Dustin. I'm up in Northern Minnesota. Um, I'm one of the three owners, founders of Pursuit Platforms. Um, One of our owners is out right now and just had a newborn baby. So he's got some family commitments. And we've got Chun in Southern California, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, so my my name is Chun. I used to live in Minnesota for a long time, like 13 years. That's how all of us met. I went hunting with Brady, the other owner, and got to know Dustin. Yeah, I moved out to uh, Southern California uh, now, but yeah, I still go back every year to hunt with this, my buddies. <laughs> you must not miss the snow. Uh, I have to ask why the big move. Was it for work or are you just you sick of the cold? Uh, I got to, uh, yeah, I, I came here for work. I got to go on rocket. So that, uh, yeah, the good opportunity. Oh, very cool. Well, we'll dive into the, to the platform stuff because, you know, I, I know a little bit about it, but not a whole lot. So, I guess my first question is what inspired you guys to come up with this and kind of how did you guys all get together to, to start on this project? Um, Brady and I have known each other for a couple of years as his wife has worked with uh, my wife's family. So that's how Brady and I got to know each other. Um, It kind of started out as we wanted to make accessories or something for the hunting industry and, um, we got together one day and I ordered my first 3D printer and I know Chun has a couple 3D printers. Um, but his big thing was he kept saying, we need to, we need to make a platform. We need to make a platform. And I just, I, I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what to do. And I just, I'm not the engineer. The other two are the engineers of the group. So I'm more of a uh, product tester um, <laughs> more than anything. And I throw my input in there when I can, but, um, they're the designers and they came up with the original prototype, which was an absolute brick. It was, it was, it was a big tank. Um, I don't know. I don't know if we lost. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Um, We lost Trune for just a second. But Trune, what I was saying is that, you know, our first prototype was the big brick. Um, it had two 45 degree sides. Uh, I couldn't print it on any of my printers that I have. Chun had to print the first couple iterations, and it it slowly developed from there. It was all about mobility, lightweight, and uh, really comfort for the hunter. Now, Chun, were you a were you a hunter going into the design of this platform, or or did you design the platform um, and then become a hunter? I was a hunter first. Like I, I was pretty new to hunting. Like, as I started a few years ago when Brady brought me out hunting for the first time. 
And uh, yeah, I, I was the one who had the biggest printer back when we first started. So uh, that's how we, uh, we built the first prototype with my printer and test in Minnesota. But yeah, I'm, uh, I was coming into hunting pretty new and I'm open to a different idea. So uh, the first year I was still using the big hunting farming um, uh, a clamber that Brady has. And then the second year we got to try saddle hunting. And then the third year, that's when we got to get our first platform and start to use it right away. So it's pretty fast learning curve for me coming so into doesn't... hunting. Yeah. Dustin, you say it started out as like a, a big block, big brick. Was it like a solid piece of plastic with no cutouts in it? Or can you kind of <laughs> um, describe that? <laughs> it, it did. It had it had slots running down the platform. So um, our new version 2 platform. So it was the same ge geometric design, but it was just slots going in it. And it was... Um, what was it, June? 13 inches by 13 inches right. by 13 like... inches, but it had 45 <laughs> degree angles on the sides of it. And, and it was, yeah. it was a very stout platform. <laughs> cool. It's like unbreakable, like almost solid. It took me a week to print. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. Wow. It took a long time. Yeah. And we I have tested a... all of them on the 3D printer too. So that's the best part about it is we knew our versions would work considering we could print them on a 3d printer and use them right you knew that the the durability of it would last yep. yeah i actually have the version two um i've had it for a couple of months but i haven't had a time to take it out it's been the weather's been so bad and just gross and um but i am excited to try it out i did see where you guys released the the new clip on the back to hold the sticks yes yep i've got that so that was something that it took a little longer than expected. You know, after COVID, everything mm -hmm. seemed to be backed up. We had multiple delays in getting even our version one out. And then with the stick clips, it took, we just received them. That's how long right. it took. We, we received them in January. So there was a big delay on that. And the same with our, our back saver or, as most of us use it for is our knee pad against a tree. Cause I'm not a, I'm not a two knee leaner guy. You know, we've got the angles designed into the platform, you know, so you're more of a branch look coming out of the tree, more natural look for a hunter's presentation. But if you ever want to just take a break, we've got the knee pad now for that. And then, like you said, the stick clips now, which is really nice too pack everything all so as everybody knows there's about a million products out there um you know in, in the hunting industry they're coming out all the time what is it that you guys think sets you apart from all the other platform companies like what makes you different um in that aspect i, I think our big advantage is, is that we have the only metal that we have in our entire product system right now is our over center buckle that's it yeah that's all the metal we have no cling no clang nothing with no sound coming from the platform itself and the bite and the size yeah and we are the lightest platform out there with only 21 ounce for everything but, yep and uh, anything that that can provide the same utilization would be way heavier and just like twice the weight right right yep so yeah. that was our big focus lightweight ergonomic and comfortable for long all day sits because that's what you have to do in minnesota that was our biggest thing you have to sit yeah. for long periods of time in transition areas hoping to see the bucks that you're going for so we wanted to make sure we had something light and mobile that we could get deep into the woods without any extra size. Yeah, when I first got my hands on, um, you know, I, I tried that platform at that expo in Ohio. Um, and then when I ended up ordering one and got one, I have a, an old metal basketball goal. It's like a post outside of my house. Mm -hmm. And I hooked it to that 
um, because I, I just have big trees in my yard. And I'll tell you yeah. what, I was expecting it to slip and I put it on there, you know, fairly tight, but not, you know, aggressively crazy or anything. And it never did slip. So that for me was like number one, because as you know, like trying to get your stand, a lock on stand or a climber right. to really bite and lock into a tree is, is always seems like a hassle. And then being plastic too, for me, I hate anything metal when I'm hunting. Um, so I, I love the platform lightness. Um, I, I got rid of my climber. Sold, <laughs> sold it on Facebook Marketplace. I, never looking back. Um, well, I still, I still have to clean a bunch of stands out of my attic because last year was a full time commitment for me. Just using this. The only other times that I didn't was when I had my daughter with me. But every time I went out was with the version one platform. Yeah, all season long. Yeah, Brady and I have been hunting with the new with the platform for two years. And the first year we just used the three D treated version, not even like fully injection ball and. They last for the whole season, no problem. You never broke it, the three D printed nope. one. Yeah, yeah, that's impressive. Yeah. Um, so I guess for anybody who's new to you know saddle hunting, but we'll we'll basically just um, focus on the platform. Okay. How how does it how does it work? Um, I know that's kind of hard to describe, but you talk about the different angles and stuff and the versatility of it. Can you kind of explain how it functions the best you can? Yep. Well, when you're, when you're in your saddle, you're facing the tree. So you're, you're always facing the tree. You've got the tree kind of as a camouflage view and your platform is sitting right on a tree and you snug it down. Now you've got two options on the sides. You've got a 15 and a 20 degree 25 degree angle and that gives you for either if you're a leaner which you find out as you practice because that's that's the biggest thing with saddle hunting you want to practice and find out where your comfort is so you have your tether to the tree so you want to find that angle and for me i've always run the 15. i'm more of a vertical hunter more than anything it's nice though because you still have enough lean away from the tree that you're you're comfortable and a lot of the weight is reduced between the platform and the saddle uh what about you do you which which angle do you like the best june for me i usually do the the 15 the, the smaller angle personally yeah. yeah because i like to sit more mm -hmm. and then that give me the perfect angle like almost yeah. straight out of the tree so i can I can see it, and if I want to lean, I can still can lean like my personal, uh, my personal personal position when I go out hunting. It's very comfortable, uh, even though for the small footprint, uh, I don't have a big big pair of foot. Okay. My foot are not that big, but it's, I still can sit out there for ten hours. Like sometimes we go hunting in Minnesota, we do have to sit out the whole day. Yeah. Yeah, and Brady Brady likes to sit on the steeper one. He's more of a yeah a leaner, and him and I both have size twelve feet, so small profile. Both of my boots, my uh, my Instagram page has pictures of both of my winter boots on them because it gets cold here in Minnesota, and no issues, snow, rain, nothing with the traction on it. Yeah, I think um, my biggest misconception when I first like saw the platform before I got to try it out was my God, how am I going to, how am I going to stand on that thing? And, <laughs> and I only wear like a size nine boot. So I'm thinking like, how are guys that are 200, you know, guys with bigger feet and everything, how, how are guys fitting on this thing? But once you get it up in a tree or once you practice on it, it just, it locks in and it makes sense. But don't, if you guys are checking out these platforms, don't let the looks of it deceive you because there's more room there than, than you think there is. And when you're leaning against the tree too, which I lean against the tree, um, it kind of allows you to kind of, you know, kick your feet out to the sides. They yeah. don't necessarily need to be completely on the platform. Um, so version two, um, when did that drop? Just a couple of months ago? That was that was another delay. We had to get our mold remachined. We put a we put a spine down the middle of it. So um, 
if you're on if you're on YouTube or anything like that and you look around and you type in pursuit platforms, um, there's a couple videos out there where guys had issues with a part of the platform buckling a little bit. Yeah. Um, which of course there's going to, there could be issues with any products that come out, but our biggest thing was making sure that the safety was taken care of. So we added the spine, Mm -hmm. um, and it added extra rigidity, but I'm not sure how a couple of them were defective. I'm, I always tell Brady and June that I'm, I'm the guinea pig because I, I'm a big guy. I'm six foot three size 12 shoes 270 pounds and i never flexed my platform and you see some of them online and i'm not sure how or what happened when they got molded if there's a temperature issue but they they seem to buckle right here on the 40 on the 30 degree yeah we do have a theory about it is probably when the the material, the plastic, go to the whole mold and meet at that that location where is the furthest point that the plastic needs to travel from the mold. And then we thought possibly the re the, the the fiber reinforcement doesn't make it there. So very small percentage of platform we have we might have that issue, Mike. And then I think starting in August last year, that when we started working on version two. We add that material in in between. So, even with the defect that we observe right now, it will stop the buckle, even with like the same issue. So, by adding that piece in there, we basically eliminate the the possibility of the platform buckle like that. Yeah, um, anybody who follows this podcast may have seen this video, but I actually took the version one platform out and tried to break it on YouTube by by jumping up and down and and stomping and and bouncing and everything else. And I weigh 160 pounds. I'm average, but um, I'll tell you what, I I never did flex it. So I I agree with you guys. It's probably some kind of manufacturing issue. I don't think it was a a design issue, but um, I – I felt totally safe in mine and I hunt very high up. So I love it. And, that, and yeah. that's just it. We look out for everybody's safety. We don't want anybody to have any issues. Um, people right. that have, have contacted us. We've, we've attempted to remedy to the best that we can get them a new platform. Some of them we've sent the version to. Um, yeah. Of course we want people to be safe, but like I said, it was just so funny when you you know we had the molds made and these they're you know they're not cheap molds to get made so when you make an altercation yeah. like that it's thousands of dollars of change and of course then you have to retest because we got them sent to us and brady and chun took them out last fall um and ran those i said i didn't need to because i i never had an issue with the version right. one um but again, it, it the safety, hunter safety is a big thing. And I know you're strapped into a tree, but you want people to feel the reliability underneath their feet. You know, when you're positioning yourself around the tree, you want to know that the, it's not going to kick, kick out, which you were talking about. The teeth that Brady designed are, are fantastic for bite. Um, you just want to know that that platform is going to be there. Yeah, that's a yeah. big thing for people is, is really being confident in your gear because if you go out in the field and even if you do everything right and you're you're sketched out once you get in that tree, it right. usually it's not going to work out for you. Well, and that's when the big buck comes by too is when you're <laughs> nervous and, and it gets on the wrong side of the tree and you're having to reposition yourself. and that's It, it all comes with practice too. So I started – um, five feet off the, you know, one, literally one stick and then the platform just to get comfortable with saddle hunting. Um, and that's, that it's not a bad way to do it. You get comfortable being able to maneuver around the tree. Again, your proper gear helps out. Definitely. Um, I want to touch on misconceptions about saddle hunting and I guess saddle hunting platforms in general, and like how you guys kind of address them, because I know there's a lot of people and I'm on social media a lot. So I read a lot about people hating on saddle hunting. Um, (laughs) 
you know, what do you kind of try to tell people to help them understand, you know? Everybody's got their preference. Here in northern Minnesota, most people hunt in what we call a Taj Mahal deer stand, a four foot by eight foot, six by eight, fully enclosed window stand. There's no mobility. A lot of people don't. They, like, I used to do it. I used to be the guy that would go to my one stand, sit there all day long, and sit there for a week straight in the same spot, see one or two deer throughout the entire week. And the mobility became a big thing. I've gotten smaller and smaller with everything that I've used. And to me, the saddle is, it's the ultimate in mobility. And there's, you have no constrictions, small trees, big trees, just the mobility. Um, we're just a different, we're a different breed. <laughs> when it comes down to it, we're all strapped into the tree. We're all trying to accomplish the same thing, but um, we just, we want to have the ability to be mobile a lot more. Now, June, yeah. you, you probably have a different outlook on this because I'm assuming you've hunted for a long time, right, Dustin? Probably since you were yes. a young kid. Yep. Yep. But June, yeah. you going into it, like you probably, you didn't grow up sitting in a box blind or the same tree stand That's for right. two weeks at a time. So it, if saddles and all that stuff were thrown out the window right now, do you think you'd go crazy if you were sitting in the same stand all the time and not being able to be mobile? <laughs> Yeah, that's that. I would go crazy because I I got brought into hunting with Brady, and he's the guy who always go explore new place, new territory. We go almost go hunting a different place every time we go, and we we really value being mobile because we both uh, public land hunters. So we mm -hmm. we go different places, try different area, and we follow the the track of the deer to find the best spot. So for us, like. I've never known the hunting style of sitting in one stand like day after day or year after year. So for me, it's a different story. That uh, so if I that's the only way I know how to hunt is being mobile. And uh, yeah, that's definitely. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I wish I grew up doing that. I, I'm the same way as Dustin. It, you get to a point where you're like, I am not looking at this tree anymore. I'm but, moving. <laughs> And, and that's when you become a mobile hunter. I think, you know, if you hunt enough, I think eventually you'll peak and get to that point or you get really bored one of the two. <laughs> and yeah. that's, that's so, what it, that's what it came down to for me was the boredom. Just like you said, I'm not going to sit in that same stand again today. And that's when my summit climber that I, that was the first real mobile piece of equipment I had. That's when that came in and I fell in love with the mobility. It's just, yeah. just not the weight that comes with it. <laughs> right. And that was, so my first one, when I first started bow hunting, I had the Cabela's climber, all steel. And with the shooting rest and the foot lounge, they called it, that was 32 pounds. Mm. Plus then you have your backpack and your bow. Then getting down to that aluminum summit at 19 pounds was and the packability of it, that packed so much better than that Cabela's climber I had originally. And now this, there's, I can put this yeah. right on the back of my pack. It, it, it makes you kind of wonder what the next 20 years looks like. As you, you know, right. you've seen it go from ladder stands to climbers to saddles. Like, what's the next thing? How do we get any lighter than that? I don't know, but I'm sure it's possible. Well, we're hope we're hoping to bring some innovation to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My uh, first year, I was I having a climber, right? Just like that's been mentioned. It was twenty pound, and adding all the gear, it was pretty heavy and clunky. I'm only six five and one hundred and thirty pounds back then, so it it was pretty heavy for me to lug all of that and hike in three or five miles with Brady. So I, yeah, like. Swinging to like um, <laughs> to saddle platform and the pursuit platform was a game changer for me. I can go a lot further and be a lot more quieter. The first wow. time he made you haul that climber back in the woods three or five miles, did you regret it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I hit every single mile of the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess lastly, before we kind of transition to some other things, um. For, for new saddle hunters, um, 
or, or somebody that's maybe a saddle hunter, but they're looking to change up their, their platform style. What advice um, would you give people when they're, they're looking into buying a new platform, you know, because they're, they're fairly expensive, like everything else, you know, everybody wants to make sure they make a good, good purchase. If you want to, if you want to start tuning yeah. or otherwise I can. Yeah, I definitely. Ahead. I would highly recommend going to the Hunter Expo, like the mobile Hunter Expo we've been to, where you get to try a, a variety of platform, different shape, different size, and see how comfortable each of, uh, each of them are, and also try different settle along with them as well. So for me, that's the best way to figure out which one's the right fit for you, and then also the, you know, like um, the bright material and the weight as well. Yeah, I think yeah. I, th I think a lot of people, um, you know, it's just like clothing preferences or boot preferences yes. or anything yeah. else. You almost have to try it before you buy it because you know everybody's different. What works for one guy might not work for the next guy it doesn't mean it's not a good product just just people have their quirks and reasons they don't want to use certain yeah. things no i agree i agree the hunter expo or the mobile hunter expo that's coming up um that'll be a great resource uh we'll be at the one in michigan we won't be able to make the one in tennessee as of right now um but benny from buzzard roost We'll be rocking the version two there too, I believe. So he'll have a couple of them up on display. Um, like Chun said, it really, I, I went through three different saddles last year. You know, I, I, I had one that I got from Brady that I tried out multiple times. I didn't care for it. It's a big name brand. I'm not going to get into that. Um, tried another big name brand. I didn't care for that. And I ended up um, settling for an arrow hunter which they're no longer in business right now but that's the one i'm using and i have a feeling i'm gonna switch to buzzard roost after again trying out benny's when i'm able to make it to the show in michigan so um it, it's it's such a comfort thing it really is it's, yeah. yeah you know people spend you know hundreds and thousands of dollars i'm guilty of it on my clothing to stay warm and my boots to stay warm and um, you know, if you neglect your comfort, you're probably not going to stay there very long. So I think, you know, right. it's important to kind of distribute however much money you got to go into hunting and, and make sure you're comfortable. Cause I'll tell you one thing, I do not like sitting in a metal stand and unless I have to, <laughs> unless I'm taking a new hunter, I'm not sitting in one of the things ever again. <clears throat> um, so I want to talk a little bit about the ethics and, and morals of hunting um, and, and, you know, the benefits of hunting for conservation would either one of you kind of want to touch on that. Um, it, it's tough in Northern Minnesota right now. Hunting is very tough, very tough in Northern Minnesota right now. I know we have a lot of big bucks up here, but we have to put forth more of a conservation effort because our deer population up here is it's it's gotten decimated between habitat um our wolf population in the area harsh winters um we've really got to look at ways as hunters um to be able to add value for the whitetail um and then ethically hunting i i haven't shot a doe in several years um one of it's because there there's so few deer you hate to take anything to help rebound the population out of the population right now um which is very hard because my family is not huge venison eaters i do my wife will eat some and she would obviously prefer a doe but there is some rationale behind it now i have a daughter that is into hunting and same thing we talk about ethical choices um, what we can do to improve habitat for the deer. We do have a couple hunting shack properties that um, my family and my wife's family own that we're going to do some work in because our, our populations are, are absolutely terrible up here right now in northeastern Minnesota. So um, we look at that. And then the other thing is, is Brady and I are looking at hunting down in southern Minnesota this year. And if Chun's able to meet up with us, um, he's going to because there's 
multiple chronic wasting disease areas. And if we can do our part to try and curb that before it stretches out to more parts of Minnesota, where it's going to ultimately end up affecting my herd up here even more, um, we're going to try and do that too. So that may be opportunities for doe hunts, but of course we got to get them tested for chronic wasting disease after you harvest. So there's, there's a lot of things that go into the ethical side of it. And um, Minnesota is not a bait state, which I love because uh, that can eliminate a lot of that spread of chronic wasting disease in some of these areas. So whatever we can do to improve the habitat the right way um, for us, it's not so much being able to put food plots out. It's a lot of um, timber stand improvement. So you get the young undergrowth, um, anything that can help out and develop future hunters is the biggest thing. Now, are you guys a one buck state? I'm assuming. We are a one buck state. The only difference is, is in the chronic wasting disease areas, you can actually shoot um, three in Southern Minnesota right now, one during rifle season, one during muzzleloader season and one during shotgun season. Wow. Um, however, that that's a six hour drive from here. So it's not like you have a ton of opportunities and it doesn't change um, my buck tag for the rest of the state. So I'll be able to continue hunting up at my hunting shack with my daughter. Yeah, that's definitely good. Chun, do you do any hunting, you know, solo in California or have you, have you even tried <laughs> to tackle that at all? Not not so much right here. I um, it's a lot. There are a lot more hunter here in Southern California, and not as many deer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with the amount of time and effort invest in that, I would rather go back to Minnesota and come with my friends. Yeah, it's probably that's, that's what I've been doing in the last few years. Yeah. I'm not a warm hunting guy. I imagine that it, it gets awful warm there to shoot deer. I'm not sure uh, what the temperature right. is there during deer season, but. People are wearing T-shirts and, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> and most but people here do. Uh, right. I see they do rifle and that. Yeah. Well, well, at least you got at least you got light gear to pack. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and he's had this. He's had the pursuit platform on a palm tree before. We have pictures of it. Oh wow! Right. I'll have to see yep. that. Yeah. <laughs> I always keep one here for you know just in case I want to go out in the tree around here and and. But most of the time I spend hunting has been back in Minnesota. Yeah. Or it's cold. I'm, That's how it right. should be. Right. <laughs> I'm sure he's gotten some looks from people when he's gone out in the saddle and put the platform on right. a tree though. Right, next to the beach, yeah, to test the platform. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this will be a good perspective on this question from both of you because Chun, you're more of a, a newer hunter and, and Dustin, you've been doing it a while. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear your answers. What are some common misconceptions about deer hunting and how, how do you address them? Chun, I think you, you probably meet people that maybe out there don't hunt as much. Dustin, maybe you live in an area where, you know, it's more common passed down. I don't know. I'm just kind of assuming that maybe yeah. I'm wrong, but um, how would you kind of address that when people are like anti hunting or they think you're just out killing for fun and, and all that good stuff? June, if you want to go ahead, you'll probably sure, have a short yeah. answer. So, uh, <laughs> a lot of my coca in here in uh, California, they, they've never seen a deer. They never even handle a bow and, uh, or a rifle. So, for them, is uh, talking, oh, I'm a, I'm a hunter. And this is the deer in the back of my office. is the first deer I ever took. And then, uh, yeah, they give me a look. But the, some of them just talk to me and say, is that cool or is that like bad for the animal? But... That, I think that's the biggest misconception that people have about hunter, right? Um, I always ask them a question, do, they, do you eat meat, right? And how do we know how, how those animals are treated in the farm? Right. Versus the deer that I harvest, the, the deer have a happy life, live freely in the wild, right? Versus the, the pig or the chicken that they have in the farm. And that changes a lot of people's perspective about hunting. Yeah, I find that usually when you hit them with that, do you eat meat? Uh, you know, you hit them with that back, they usually shut up pretty fast because most right. of them do. 
and then they yeah. have no argument after that. Um, what about exactly. you, Dustin? You probably don't encounter that as much. No, um, I do have some friends that actually are not are not big into hunting. I have I have a wall out in my living room that has several deer heads on it, and I still I still get looks and questions from some of my friends. But for the most part, everybody in northern Minnesota is a hunter, knows a hunter, or has had a hunter in their family at one point or another. So it's it's very limited, but it's a lot of people, just like Chun said, a lot of people don't think about um, where their meat comes from. Uh, we we buy everything that we have. We we raise. Um, we buy we buy pigs. My father in law we we have land out of his place that we have pigs. His next door neighbor ha- raises our cow, so everything that we eat in our house we know exactly where it came from what's been put in the body of that animal and it's it's a healthier choice in all reality when it comes down to knowing exactly what you're putting on your plate um we raise chickens too so my wife and i have chickens i know chun used to raise chickens back here in minnesota everything is for us it's more of a lifestyle we're not a lot of people think that a lot hunters for the most part are drunken hillbillies driving around in their truck shooting deer it's a terrible misconception that um the younger generation has tried very hard to change and it has to continue to change um because you do see you do see some big names that still get caught throughout multiple states Mm -hmm. um illegally harvesting deer i know there's a couple cases that have just happened in the last and that's that's not good publicity for anybody in the hunting industry it does not look good it's not an ethical thing in my opinion um and just like i said earlier about the baiting we're an illegal bait state do people still do it around here i'm sure they do yeah if you can limit, if you can eliminate some of those misconceptions, the drunken hillbilly just going out to shoot stuff up, which is a lot of a lot of people have started to change that in our industry. And social media is, is as evil as social media can be at times. It has helped um, show the conservation side and the ethical side of a majority of the hunting community. Yeah, I definitely think it's it's a a step in the right direction. Um, I've heard that from a lot of people is people just assume, um, you know, hunters, deer hunters or whatever hunters are, are blood, you know, blood lust, yep. blood thirsty killers. And I know people that are like that. Um, not friends, but you know, know people that just want to kill stuff, but 99% of us, um, I know for me, that's my least favorite part is shooting the animal. It's all about the process for me and, right. and bringing home the meat. So, Right. And I can, I can sit in a stand for days and if I'm in an area that has deer um, and watch <laughs> them, watch them. But there's something internally, like it's, it's kind of wired into your DNA that when you decide that you're going to take an animal, um, whether it's a trophy deer, a small buck, uh, a doe, my heart starts just racing. So it's it's truly is buck fever, um, and that's that. Eth- you know, you're playing out ethical dilemmas in your head. You want to make the good shot. You want to have an ethical kill. You want to put the animal down. And it's it. Not everybody's wired to be able to do that. And then there's some people, like you said, it, it, that are just out for bloodlust. And um, to me, if if I ever become that kind of hunter, I think I'm going to probably have to hang it up because that's I lose the joy in it. Then, you know, I've heard, um, I've listened to a lot of podcasts, watch YouTube, social media, whatever. Um, I've always heard that poachers they don't get like that buck fever feeling. Their their thrill comes from uh, outsmarting the game warden fear um, the, the fight of not getting caught which yeah so i mean I, I think if you get that buck fever you know it's kind of like you want to make like you said you want to make a good shot you're like that's your nerves telling you not to yep. screw up yep. um, so 
I don't know. I, I'm with you. If I ever lose that too, I don't think I don't think I would hunt anymore. It's not that it's it's not that it's exciting and like that for me. I just I think my heart wouldn't be in it if I didn't feel right. all those emotions. Yep. Um, so most challenging deer hunting situation, uh, this will be interesting too, um, because we have a new hunter and an experienced hunter or a fairly new hunter, no offense, June. Um, <laughs> but I, I'd like to, to hear if, if you can think of something, your most challenging deer situation or how you screwed something up or, um, you made something work, you know, in a split second, you know, how, how it goes really fast always. <clears throat> You want to my to hear my deer story? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Let's hear it. <laughs> the only deer that I ever took was in like thirty minutes away from Minneapolis. It was in the city, so that day I was going scouting. Like, well, I've been hunting with Brady for the whole time, so let's let's go out and scout for once. So I get to learn how to read the deer sign and things like that. That was the day after Christmas. It we just had a fresh snow. And uh, I walked in and saw some deer side. Oh, this light looked like something Brady would tell me. This is a good deer side. So I just follow that. <laughs> the footstep and I see some rub. And then 20 yards later, I saw an uh, antler just passing by me. So I walked closer to it and I saw the ground. It was still warm. And I figured, oh, that's a deer just standing here. And he, I probably woke him up from a nap. And then I looked 20 yards. To the left, I saw a deer standing right there, standing and looking at me. He wasn't scared. He's just like, this guy looks like a small little guy. I'm not, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so I was quickly text Brady. I, so for that whole hunting session, I was on my phone the whole time texting Brady like, hey, Brady, I just woke a bug up from the bed. What do I do? <laughs> and, then, and then Brady just keep telling me, stay, stay low and then try to camouflage. And, and 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 pursue the deer so that's what i did i was following following the deer for the next 30 minutes try to stay very low and make as little noise as possible while texting back and forth with brady and say hey, what do i do next <laughs> until i was like 30 minutes before uh, it getting dark and then brady told me you need to hurry up man it's gonna be gone before uh, if you want to lose some light soon, then I start to hurry up. And the closest I get to the deer was like five yards. And the moment he saw me standing up, that's when he figured out this is not another small animal. It's a real hunter with a bow. And <laughs> he ran away. And uh, lucky for me, he wasn't he wasn't running too far away. Then I got about 20... 20 yard of clear shot that's when i took a shot and that was that was the most scary part of the hunt for me is when i really need to pull the trigger right on the bow um the deer probably made another five yard hop and then he was down um Damn. yeah that i i still feeling my right, heart is racing when i telling you this story <laughs> because that was the first deer i ever took and it was on my own it's um, on a very uh, quiet day after the snowstorm. Um, it was rewarding for me, but it was uh, really, uh, I feel really lucky. Everybody told me I was the most lucky guy ever. <laughs> and the deer didn't run away from me and just hanging around in the same spot. Um, and that was also the first time I got to get a deer. I put on the microphone and called Brady and he, and he tell me, you need to start from here. Go all the way up. Don't mess up with the gut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he made you gut it yourself. He wasn't there to do yeah, that I, either. He, he was in Wisconsin when I'm in Minnesota. <laughs> oh, so, man. Yeah. Did you uh, did you pop its stomach? No, I was very careful. <laughs> man, I was that's... totally unprepared. I was lucky that I bring a, a knife with me that day. That's impressive. Did you Did you crawl up to that deer to five yards? Yeah, he was like right behind the bush while I was on the other side of the bush. That's a good uh, point when we talk about ethical choice, right? When we go hunting, uh, seeing I go along with Brady and he was teaching me how to take an ethical shot. So I was really not trying to take a shot when I couldn't get a clear 
clear point, clear shot of the beer. Yeah, so that's why I go so close to it. Did you buy a lottery ticket that day? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't buy a lottery ticket, but my wife was uh, very surprised when he bring back home a beer. He said, she said, I thought he was going out scouting. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. What about you, Dustin? Um, any situations like that come to mind? I'm sure, you've had well, some I, stories. I just want to say one thing on on Chunsan. <laughs> it was an absolutely giant Minnesota ten pointer for his first year. Scored over what was it was close to one fifty for his first deer ever. It was a beast. So yeah, yeah, I still probably two hundred pounds. <laughs> He's way yep. bigger than Big I was. Gear. We'll have to we'll have yeah. to throw that up on the on the show notes or on the cover page for that so everybody can see it because that, that's impressive. First it, bow, it was first, like first deer with a bow, and and being yep. that that class size, that's impressive by yourself. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I was, and he was green. <laughs> <laughs> I was green. I was I was texting Brady ten yard after I was. Pulling the deer out of the wood, I say, I'm I'm exhausted and I start hitting myself from shooting this deer. <laughs> <laughs> um, for myself, it, my biggest challenge for me was was getting into the mobile mindset, and um, it really came really came together for me prior to even saddle hunting about the mobility. Um, I started hunting with a gentleman from work. And he had, he's got a pretty big property, a lot of deer activity on it. Um, but there was a lot of, he, he taught me right away. He was the one who convinced me to get a summit stand. Mobility is key, even on his private property. It's if you're sitting for an hour and a half and you don't see any deer, you need to move. And it came down to, um, it, it was, it was, 70 degrees out so it was a hot day and it was the same thing he texted me and said i'm gonna head to town to pick up his kid from school to hunt for the evening and i told him i haven't seen anything yet and he kind of gave me a heads up and he said why don't you try and move over to this area obviously perfect timing one o'clock in the afternoon sneak into the area um and try and climb up into the stand again 70 degrees hunting in a t-shirt and a blaze orange vest um and I, I got lost on my way into the location that i was looking for and i finally found a tree to set up on and when i got set up my gun was on the ground and 30 yards away i had two does and a buck standing there chasing them in the swamp edge and it was the same thing it was panic mode trying to get the shot without falling out of the damn tree <laughs> um <laughs> And pulling the gun up without spooking them. And this was during rifle season in Minnesota. And they were 30 yards away. They had no idea I even climbed up that tree with the mobility. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I harvested that buck. It was a, a beautiful 11-point buck. Um, same thing, like 200 pounds. Big northern Minnesota brute. But it was the getting over the mobility mindset for me was one of the hardest things to do. Um, hearing, yeah, if you're sitting on my property and you sit for an hour and a half and you don't see a deer, you need to move. And that was that was the biggest thing. He kept drilling into my head. I'm like, well, I'll just sit for another half hour. I'll sit for another half hour. No, get out of the stand. Go somewhere else. Find another ridge. Find another valley. Hunt somewhere else. They're not there. You need to move. And that was that was my biggest thing to overcome. Yeah, that's a that's a hard thing. I struggled with that also um, going into the mobile hunting thing. When you grow up going to the same stand and and your dad, or your grandpa, or whoever teaches you is like, just sit here and wait. Just sit here and wait. It's, yep. it's just like, I don't know if brainwashing is the right word, but it's just like you almost feel guilty if you're like moving. You're like, what if I get down and you know a big deer is gonna walk by? <laughs> that. It took a season or two for me to do that, and now I'm in the mindset of, my God, I'm not sitting here anymore. So it it is. It's tough. Um, it was tough for me too. I, I bet you it is probably for a lot of people. Um, but it is. It's more fun to get out there and chase after them deer and, and and sit in new places. And that's what it's all about: is seeing new places and and honing your skills and and being su successful. You know. Um, 
So when we talk about important lessons that you've learned from deer hunting, um, is there anything specific that comes to mind that's impacted your life maybe outside of hunting? That's, a, that's actually a tough one because this is something I've grown up with. Um, it's, it's the value of, for me, it's the value of solitude. I, I find it so peaceful and relaxing for myself to sit in a stand Um, I work shift work and my wife always laughs because there's times where I'll come off of a midnight shift. I'm going to go hunt this morning. It's like, well, normally you would sleep. I said, yes, but I find for myself that there's nothing more calming, even on a cold Northern Minnesota day for me to sit in a stand and, and be around nature. And again, it's something I grew up with. I started hunting with my dad when he was a bow hunter. Um, I think the first time I sat in a stand, I was probably seven or eight years old. I had an army belt and a belt around my waist to hold me into his tree stand. You know, there was no harnesses back then. Um, So a lot has changed, but it's always come back to, even if I'm not 100% focused on my surroundings, you still feel the peace and calm and if if you can have that chance it's a big deal june what about for you um is there anything Um, that that you felt like your your life has changed or has kind of taught you outside of hunting after shooting that deer or going with brady maybe maybe before you even shot the deer did it give you a different uh, outlook on anything absolutely so i used to think like other people before i get into hunting is like hunting is really like feeling anymore and you know and uh i really changed my uh, my perspective after going start going hunting and also take the idea is totally changed my my perspective about like how i get the food how important it is to get an ethical uh, meat sauce right so uh that's really changed for me and uh also, another part is about being out there and enjoying the nature and really appreciate what we got in the world. I grew up in Vietnam, in Hanoi. It's a very big city. I was a city boy. I was always <laughs> around people. So uh, that's one of the things I miss the most moving out here in California is being away from staying in Minnesota is my access to go be in the nature and just sitting there and listen to the tree listen to the forest and everything else around and see the sunrise yeah so uh, i deeply feel like i i appreciate the nature and everything else and conservation more after i start becoming a hunter well i uh i apologize for having to reschedule on you guys i know we had this set up for last night and you know things happen but um before we get out of here i want you guys to tell everybody where they can find you on social media, where to find pursuit platforms, you know, if they want to try them out at an expo or um, where they can buy them at on your website. Okay. Um, it's, we're just www.pursuitplatforms.com is our website. That's where you can get the um, version two platform. We also have a few version ones left. If you're looking at getting saving five ounces, um, <laughs> So that's where you can you can purchase right there on our website. Uh, I see on the bottom of the screen we have Pursuit Platforms. We are on Instagram, um, and we are on Facebook under Pursuit Platforms. Um, myself is Pursuit underscore Platforms underscore Dustin on Instagram. So if you're looking to just chat with me, that's a way of doing it. And I know Chun is also on there, and so is Brady. Um, it, it, it's was totally acceptable rescheduling for tonight. Everything worked out for June and I, we knew Brady was kind of going to be a wild card anyways with everything <laughs> that he's got going on in his life. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's the best ways to get a hold of myself and um, connect with pursuit platforms. So we're on, we have a YouTube channel that we're going to start trying to post more to. Um, we do have multiple channels to get a hold of us at and then, Tune if you want to add your social plug on there. Oh, you're still muted. 
Chun's, uh, I think yeah, he's no. outside yeah. somewhere, so he's he's gonna mute in between right. his things here. Yeah. So the yeah the easiest and best way to reach out to us is to pursue platform from Facebook or Instagram. We we monitor our channel all the time and try to get back to everybody as soon as we can see the message. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, like I said, I apologize about rescheduling, and I I appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, lastly, when is that expo? Um, up near you guys in case anybody listening is near you uh, if you have the date or the, the i times. i will pull it up quickly i believe it is june if you know it off the hot top of your head that would be it's fine, the mobile July. hunter expo mm -hmm. and is it that's the same guys that put on the one in ohio last year right yep right so that's one would be and then you guys will you guys will have platforms there to try out. Um, people can stand on them and jump on them and see how tough they yeah. really are. I wouldn't lie to you guys; them things are are durable as hell. Yep. So they have two shows this year. The Southern Show is in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It is on February or not February. Sorry about that. Um, June twenty third, twenty fourth. And the Northern Show will be at the Kalamazoo County Expo, and that is July 29th, 28th and 29th of July. So there's two opportunities um, to try and catch up with us. Uh, again, we may not be at the Southern Show, but we should have some representation. Hopefully our buddy Benny from Buzzard Roost will be there, and he'll be able to have one of our platforms on there. And Benny will have some um for sale and then he also sells them in his pro shop down in louisiana and then we'll hopefully have a new booth set up this year for people to be able to try out uh the buzzard roof saddles since we worked well with them and uh try out the platform we'll have version two and we might even have a couple giveaways that you can sign up for there so cool and then lastly who puts on that expo uh, in case people want to look it up and and see the other vendors and stuff at that okay uh, expo. yep it is the mobile hunters expo.com and it is powered by spartan forage it looks like so um big name in the scouting industry spartan forage talking about your um opportunity to learn about the habitat they also have some big name speakers coming there this year i know the northern show as of right now um has a diy sportsman and uh the hunting beast will be there also Ooh. So they're going to be there to talk at both at the Northern Expo for sure. Sweet. Sounds like a good time. I might have yes, to make the drive be, up there. It's going to be a great time. Um, so again, that's July 28th, 29th is when we'll have our booth set up there at the Mobile Hunter Expo in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Cool. Well, anybody listening, uh, if you have time or you live close there, definitely take the time to check it out. I, I went to the one in Ohio last year and, and – I was super glad I went a lot, lots of stuff to try out. And it's nice when, you know, a lot of this stuff is sold online, so you can't go to Bass Pro right. and try it out. So um, it's definitely worth the 10 or $15 to get in to, to try out the gear and, and talk and meet people. And um, it's a good time. So, all right, yes. guys, well, I'll, I'll let you get out of here. I, I appreciate you guys coming on and uh, chat with you guys soon. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yep. All right. We'll see yep. you guys. Take care. Thank you. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Hunt the Wild podcast. If you enjoyed the show and it's brought you some sort of value, I'd love if you could give me a rating and a review. Just a few seconds of your time can help me better understand the type of content you all enjoy, and it would mean the world to me to hear from all of you.